It's, com it's, it's complicated even if your view of freedom is just this freedom of indifference. To take a more uh, Occam, uh, nominalist approach and say it's pure, purely freedom of indifference. That's, what, that's the goal, that's the aspiration. You still have tough questions when it comes to coercion. Because, okay, if it's freedom of indifference, then at what point does my neighbor's love for neon signs in a residential neighborhood, <laughs> now he's got a neon sign up that has Madonna torturing bunnies, <laughs> and, the, and the volume is 150 decibels, uh, I think it's time for some coercion. I think it's time for our, her freedom to, to stop and my freedom to begin. But, okay, but what if it's just a really tacky yard sign? It's not neon, it's not loud. Well, what if she wants to knock down her house and build a really strange house that's completely out of keeping with the rest of the uh, neighbor? Well, okay, probably. So again, there's gray areas even there. It gets even more complicated if you don't take anomalous view but you take this idea that freedom is, yeah, there's this element of freedom of choice, but beyond that there's this notion of freedom for, for excellence, and that the virtuous society is integral to the free society. Then you get into questions, uh, should people be free to take LSD in the privacy of their own homes? Should people be free to redefine marriage? So it gets even more complex uh, once you have this, this higher notion of freedom. Okay, and we inherit a tradition that sees a separation between church and state, or as uh, Dr. Gregg said, between the spiritual and the temporal. And most of us would point to Christ's words, render to Caesar what is Caesar's, and to God what is God's. I want you to, do you remember the context of that saying of Jesus, as most of you do, since you're preachers? They're trying to trap Jesus, right? They know, <laughs> okay, this is, oh, this is sweet. We got him now. We got him now because everybody hates paying taxes to the Romans, all, all these peasants and stuff that we, were, that we have a kind of partial rule over. We Pharisees, teachers of the law. And Jesus is really popular with these guys, with these folks, these peasants, and these uh, merchants, you know, whatever. So we're going to ask him a question. And he's either going to say, Oh, you should not render, uh, you should not pay taxes to Caesar because this has the image of Caesar as being divine and God is only divine and Israel is its own kingdom and you shouldn't pay it. And then they'll go, oh yeah, great, yeah. Oh, peasants, cheer Jesus. Ooh, way to go. We're going to go get the Romans. He guard you all. Or he would say, no, you just really need to pay your taxes to those evil Romans. Sorry. I'm, I'm on the Roman team. <laughs> Push comes to shove. I seem pretty courageous, but really I'm going to roll over and you know, keep my head down and be a team player with these invaders. And then they could feed them. And then the teacher law could feed them to the pet. You know, pet. Yeah, we did, you were different. <laughs> so it was a perfect trap, right? And then Jesus has this, this amazing answer. He asks them to bring a coin as Caesar's inscription. And he says, render to Caesar what is Caesar's and to God's to God, what is God's? And the first thing it does is make people think, okay, wow. You know, Jesus could have walked out, even if there had been somebody grumpy at the answer, it would have taken him five minutes to figure it out, and he could have gone <laughs> on to the next town. But it got them thinking, okay, wow, okay, what is Caesar's and what is God's? Obviously, God is over everything that Israelites understood, but is he saying that God has put Caesar in charge of certain things, that they would have had the Old Testament to know that God did that from time to time, and not always with an Israelite king. You know, there was, there was Nebuchadnezzar, and there was the Persian Empire, clear evidence that God had raised those people up. So they'd get to thinking about that. But think about, maybe there were some Roman soldiers nearby. And they're, they're listening, okay, here, let's, let's listen in on this. Maybe a centurion or something. Maybe somebody that knew Pilate. <coughs> What's he going to say? Yeah, because he could be getting in hot water here if he gives the wrong answer. And then he says, give to Caesar what is Caesar's. And they're like, yeah, the coin, Caesar, taxes. Oh, good. <laughs> but I want you to think of what Jesus did. As <coughs> Imagine the, the Roman soldier is there, or the centurion or whatever, and Jesus says this, and it's like him handing him 
what appears to be, say, something very innocuous, a loaf of bread or something. Could please go take this back to Caesar. Oh, okay, yeah, it looks good. He was handing him a time bomb. A time bomb that would, would cover the entire Roman Empire, okay, because it would transform the way we, the way the, the Roman culture, Roman civilization understood church and state and how they related. Always up to that time, church and state were one. The emperor was, if not viewed as a god, was viewed as the son of a god, uh, was, was worshipped. And there was this, this tight integration. And that wasn't just Rome, that was just, that was just human history. Okay, let's look, there is a balance here. Jesus wasn't saying, and since everything's God, you know, tell the Romans to go jump in a lake. You, you'll see from you know, the, the apostles, Paul, let every person be subject to the governing authorities, for there's no authority except from God. And those authorities that exist have been instituted by God. And Peter says, honor the emperor. What's the, the best estimate of it, you know, based on trying to date when Peter wrote this, who the emperor was. Anybody? I'm sure there's some debate about this, but what's... Nero. Nero is then kind of the... You have people giving educated guesses in Nero. Nero, he was a wonderful leader, wasn't he? And so it's no wonder Peter said to honor the emperor, right? He's like in the, you know, the top... He'll, he makes the top list, right, of really bad emperors. And yet Peter's saying, honor the emperor. So we know that, there, that there's a really strong calling to obey the governing authorities. It's not simply a matter of, oh, if it's really good, if it's a really good leader, then obey him. If the leader wants a little too, many, too much taxes, <coughs> then you can disobey. No. So if any, any of you here, any of your parishioners were hoping to find something in scripture that could allow them to uh, uh, give uh, the current government the finger and not, <laughs> and, and not be a, a, a obedient citizen, you're not going to find it in the Bible. Now, of course, if it comes to the government asking you to give to Caesar something that is God's, <coughs> ask you to do something fundamentally immoral, as may be happening now with hospitals, being, there, there's some uh, attempts to make rule changes that will uh, insist that hospitals do abortions, then, then we have a different matter. But there's uh, clearly a strong calling here to be obedient, uh, beginning with, say, how fast you drive down the road. I have to remind myself of that regularly. Especially growing up in the West Texas where you have these big flat open highways where it's like, come on, 95 is safe. There's nobody around. <laughs> okay, so this time bomb, right? It takes a long, it's, a, it's, a, it's got a really long,